On this episode we learn some hard truths about programming. It's just shenanigans to the highest degree. Obi-Wan drinks a variable. We heat a spaceship off the screen. Amazing. And Christian gets a glimpse of infinity. Ah! Hmm. Hi everybody, I am Christian. Welcome to LazyDesk Academy and today we are going to be learning how to make a video game from scratch in Pico 8. A beautiful little shmup. And already we are off to a good start. In the last episode we learned all about function calls. We called a bunch of functions and we created this beautiful art. <sighs> Amazing. Today our goal is going to be how to find out how to make things move on the screen. This is what video games are. They are an animated medium. We have to animate things. That's going to be the goal for today. In order to do that, we're going to have to learn, sadly, two kind of abstract concepts. And they're going to come together to allow us to move things. First concept we're going to learn today is about functions. We're going to write our own functions. We learned about how to call functions previously. We have not learned about how to make functions. The second concept we're going to learn today is going to be about variables. Complicated word, but so, so useful once you wrap your head around this. Let's go. Now, off the bat, we're going to have to do some revisionist stuff. We're going to delete this angry face. We're going to delete this orange. In fact, uh, last time, at the end of the last episode, I gave you a task of creating a, uh, you know, in a, in a doggy zone, right? You remember the doggy zone? I gave you a task of creating a spaceship and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a beautiful red spaceship. You, know, you don't have to copy the spaceship. You already have your own spaceship, right? This is just me. This is just me uh, uh, catching up with you guys, right? Just, just doing my own spaceship thing. I don't know. It doesn't have to be beautiful right now, although it is. I have to say. I love mental spaceship. Is that good? Be honest. Is that okay? I think that's okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, spaceships. We want to think about how to make beautiful artwork later on. So far, I'm just like, like, you know, you can see how quickly you can whip up a little sprite and that's the thing that counts to me. Now, we're going to actually move on to this code and I'm going to be really harsh about this code. I'm going to delete most of the code. But before I do, I will show you some trick. Something you can do in code is you can uh, say minus minus and, you know, the text uh, turns gray. And that's where you can write a comment. You can actually write a little message for you for later uh, to kind of like explain what the code does in plain, plain English. So you don't have to like remember some specific commands. You can just write in something that for you to remember what, for example, a line of code is doing. Or you can, um, you know, make some notes, some to-do list, for example, for you to do. So I like to do that. Um, I'm going to write, start writing here. Uh, I'm going to say like this will clear the screen. Something like this. And I'm going to be really, really harsh. Something you can do if you don't want to delete code, you can comment code out. You can just put a minus minus at the beginning and it will turn the entire line gray. And that means, you know, the program, the computer won't execute this line. It will say like, ah, that's some kind of comment. I'm just going to ignore it. And this allows you to kind of delete code, but kind of keep it around so you can bring it back. Very, very common method of, of if you're like scared of deleting old stuff. I am not scared of deleting old stuff. We will bring this beautiful artwork back at some point. Uh, but and so far, I'm really just interested in moving a single sprite on the screen. That's something I'm not good. I have to. I have this spaceship, and I want this spaceship to fly. And for that, I want to, um, you know, draw it on the screen. So I'm going to clear the screen. Sprite one. I'm going to put it smack in the middle of the screen, like so. And actually, the clear screen, I'm going to uh, turn this to zero. So we're going to have a beautiful black background, right? Black background, ship in the center of the screen, kind of in the center of the screen, a little bit off. It's, it's, it's fine. It's good enough. Sprite one, X position, horizontal position, Y position, vertical position. Good. Stuff that we already had in the previous episode. And I'm going to actually save this. I'm going to save this. I'm going to call this 
shmup, because this is the beginning of our shmup. Momentous occasion. <sighs> Good. So now talking about functions. As I already said, we already did kind of functions. We already, in, the only thing that we did in first episode was calling functions. Or that these are the green things, right? We're calling a function, like on the cell phone. Yes, I want you to draw an ugly rectangle. <laughs> Thank you so much. We, we're calling functions to make them do things, right? We're calling them by their name. There are some names. The functions have names that we have to remember, like CLS is one function, SPR is a different function, print is another function, right? That's calling functions. Now, what we're going to do is going to write our own functions. And Functions, you will see that there are actually, there's a lot of reasons for why we want to do this. This is, there's not just like one reason for why we want to have a function. Um, generally, functions is something that basically your entire program will consist of eventually, which is weird because I just told you that a program is something like a recipe, right? Like a recipe where you just have commands after each other, they're being executed. So why are we, I'm talking that the, that the program suddenly like a, collection of functions, that doesn't make sense. Um, well, you know, even a recipe book, like like it's, it's a book, right? And books have also ways, like you, when you write a book, you just don't write like one sentence after another until you finish with a book. Like that's not how books work. That's not how you read a book. You don't just read sentence after another in an endless stream of consciousness kind of thing. Books also have ways of structuring things. They structure the content. So you, the entire book is a big story, obviously. For example, if it's a book, not a, not a recipe book, but if it's a, like a narrative book, like a, like a novel, right? It is this big story, right? But that big story will, have, will consist of smaller stories. There will be chapters in the book, maybe. And each chapter is kind of like a small mini book inside your big book. And this is kind of like what functions are too. They're kind of like little programs within our programs and our whole, whole big program will consist of smaller programs. And it's gonna be easy to tackle one, um, to divide the big task of creating an amazing game into a smaller task of creating the initial functions. Each program will start with three very basic functions that from where everything begins basically. And I'm gonna show you those functions right now. I'm going to introduce to you right now. Bear with me. There's a whole, whole new bunch of stuff happening. I'm going to start writing the word function. And as I finish writing the word function, it turns pink, not green, pink. This is different from what we did before. Before we called functions. And when we call those special functions, they turned green. But now we're not calling functions. We are writing a function. And so we, when we write this word function, because it's like a statement that Pico already knows about, it will turn it in a different color to make, to indicate that what Pico 8 thinks the thing that we're writing here is. It's fine. If it's pink, if it's turning pink, you're on the, on, on the right track. Uh, and I'm going to then write the word in it, underscore in it, which is a weird word. Open and close parentheses, enter, enter, and that was weird. So let's try this again. I'm going to write a function. I'm going to go underscore draw. Open close parentheses. And huh. Huh. You think this was weird? Not weird enough. We're going to do this a third time around. I'm going to write the word function, turns pink. Awesome. And then we're going to go underscore update. Like updog, but update. Open and close parentheses. And hmm, hmm, what are these? These are three, we did just define three functions, three chapters from our book, so to speak. But all these functions are empty and is, our goal is going to be to fill those functions with stuff. But first we have to understand what these functions do. I'm going to actually go ahead. I'm just going to write a th fourth function. We can, you, have, you can have as many functions as you want. I'm going to go function and I'm just going to call it Jason or Josh or Josephine Lina or I can call it 
my amaze, amazing function. Open close parentheses and then end. You can also give it a very uh, memorable name, something like. Oh, <laughs> one important feature of, of Pico 8 is that there is no lower and uppercase. Everything is uppercase. So when you start writing things in uppercase, weird characters appear. You probably already noticed. Uh, yeah, is a very, very memorable name for a lot of people from Poland out there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, whatever you want. Uh, so yeah, that's how you define the function. And again, those names you can pick yourself uh, however you want. However, those three functions, they have very, very special names. This is not names that I personally picked. These are names that Pico8 kind of picked for us because Pico8 treats those names, functions with, that are called like this, very, very specially. As I already said, previously when we had functions, we were calling them by their name. We called CLS, we called SPR from our code. We called them, we called them. But these functions are special because those functions, we don't call them. We could, but we don't. These functions are functions that Pico8 will call by itself as it executes a, a game. And, and so, for example, the init function is called once at the beginning when you launch the program. When somebody hits Control R, it will, right now nothing happens because the functions are empty. But when you press Control R, uh, all that's inside the init function will get executed. What is inside the init function? Well, everything that is between the statement function init and the statement end here. Everything that's inside those two, that will get called. Right now, there's nothing inside here, but for example, a good idea to put in the init function is would be a CLS statement. So let's put the CLS statement in here, like this. Okay, okay, good, good. Now, what is a draw function? The draw function is, is quite different. The init function gets called once at the beginning, right? The draw function gets called every time Pico8 wants to draw a frame to the screen of our game. And uh, the word frame, the concept of frame should be familiar to us if, you <laughs> if you've been dealing with video games, right? Uh, video games are show frames on the screen. It's, um, it's a concept from animation, from movies, actually. A movie, if you look at an old like film, like a movie film, right? It will consist of, of individual pictures that are switch very, very quickly. And uh, if you switch the pictures very quickly and make small changes in each, each subsequent pictures, you will create an, the illusion of movement, right? Movement, that's what was our goal, remember? That's our goal here, right. So we're gonna create, uh, uh, so so yeah, an animation is a sequence of, of images that are, that are created and that are changed very quickly. How quickly? Insanely quickly. That's the idea that it's, they change so quickly that our eyes cannot really follow, cannot really see them as individual pictures, but they kind of like merge together into like a fluid uh, animation, the illusion of animation. Uh, it's gonna be at least 30 frames per second in Pico 8. 30 frames per second, we're gonna also learn how to do 60 frames per second. So every single second, we're gonna call this draw function uh, or pq8 will call this draw function at least 30 times it will just it will just bombard us with uh, with whatever is in here if we're gonna if we put a seal as zero it will clear the screen 30 times per second which is okay like it seems insane but it it will just go like this you won't you won't even notice i mean you will notice but it will be just like it yeah it will just happen in instantly so do we have the draw function? And now there is also the update function and that's kind of the same. I'm gonna to have to say that's kind of the same. There is a subtle difference and we're gonna discuss the difference. Generally, what you want to do is things that are about drawing things to the screen, creating a frame are gonna be in the draw function. In the update function, we are going to put things that are about gameplay that are about, you know, changing the position of objects, doing collision detection, 
uh, doing the gameplay kind of stuff. You know, this is stuff that will go and update. The logical stuff is again will happen in an update. And the visual stuff is going to be happening in draw function. And the subtle difference between the two is that update will actually happen, you know, uh, 30 frames per second. It will, no matter what happens, it will actually, uh, Pico 8 will do whatever it can to actually call this 30 times per second. With a draw function, sometimes it won't be called because if if Pico 8 gets really busy and if we're going to create a very you know big program that really taxes um, uh, the CPU, then maybe some draws will get you know, some frames will get dropped. Right? That's that's a, like a term that you have. You have dropped frames. So the function calls sometimes when Pico 8 is busy. Sometimes Pico 8 won't actually draw another frame because it, it doesn't have the time for that. Whereas with the update function, it's assured 30 frames per second if it can pull it off. Okay, just like some ideas. Right, okay, good. So we cleared the screen. How are we going to move things? Well, I mean, we're drawing the ship. What, in which function does it belong to? Well, we're gonna put it in the draw function because that's about drawing the ship, right? Okay, and this comment here, this will cream the screen. I'm gonna put it in here. Actually, I'm going to actually even do a comment and, and reiterate what we just talked about. Uh, init gets called once at the beginning of the program, right? Draw gets called uh, when a new frame gets drawn to the screen 30 fps and an update is for gameplay hard 30 fps right Just some information for us. And here with the sprite, we can write here, this draws the ship. Okay, I'm gonna press escape. I'm gonna type in save and it will save shmup.p8. By the way, there's also a shortcut for this. Control S will also save uh, uh, the program. And actually something that has become kind of like a, uh, uh, habit whenever I work with Pico 8 is going to control S for saving and control R for running. So you save before you run because maybe running the program will cause some crash you don't know. So you want to save control S and then run control R. Like it has become like a quick habit. It was actually quite difficult to get around the habit <laughs> during the first episodes here. So now that I explained the habit, I don't have to, I don't have to do it manually every time. Uh, okay, yeah, so good. So now the question is, how are we going to um, animate things? Well, the problem is now, if we run this, right, the ship doesn't move. Uh, we have to do something else. Wh why doesn't it move? Because we we don't, we just keep drawing it in the same spot on the screen. Um, actually, um, at this point, I'm actually gonna clear the screen, CLS zero also in a draw function i'm going to clear the screen at the beginning but also i want to clear the screen every time um, in every frame i'm going to explain in a second why that is okay so we every frame 30 times per second we're clearing the screen and we're drawing the ship in this specific position now in order for the ship to move on the screen we actually have to change something we cannot always draw it in the same position we have to change it in a different position something has to change. It has to kind of like vary over time. We need a variable. That's right. So every time something changes over time, we need a so-called variable. What are variables? So the analogy for variables I like to use is that they are kind of like containers, kind of like this cup I have here. So this is a mug I have at my house. And you know, sometimes there's coffee inside and sometimes there's tea inside and sometimes it's just hot water. 
This is a container for various liquids. I can use this to store and manipulate liquids. Variables are also containers, but they are not for liquids, obviously, but for data, for information. And that's funky, and we're gonna try to nail down what that means in a second, hold that thought. But before we go there, I also wanted to extend the container analogy a little bit, and I want us to keep in mind two things about variables. One is that, as I already said, they have some content. There's something inside a variable, like there's, you know, liquid inside a cup. And the other thing is that variables have names, so we can distinguish them from each other. Like, you see how this cup has meow written on it? Well, that's as good of a variable name as any. And if I was, for example, like in an office environment, I could say something like, Don't use my meow cup ever again, or I will hunt you down. The name meow would be a good way for me to specify to others which cup belongs to me. So that's the two things I want you to remember. Variables have content inside of them and variables have names. Okay, if variables are containers for data, so let's get back to the question, what exactly is data? And the thing is, you've already seen data. Actually, you've already programmed it. Remember how stuff turns blue in Pico 8? That's the thing that goes in the variables. Ta-da! So every time you see something that is blue, we can put that stuff in a variable. Here's how it works. I'm gonna create a new variable. I'm just gonna come up with some name. Let's call this Harry. Harry the variable. And then I'm gonna say equals, and I'm gonna say 40. Ta-da! That's it. That's how you do it. That's all there is. <laughs> it's really not that difficult. I'm just inventing a name, Harry, and I'm using the equal sign to put the number 40 into Harry. I just put 40 into Harry. Okay. Okay. Good. And so what can I do with this? Well, Harry is now 40. So Harry has kind of become uh, a placeholder for the number 40. So every time, for example, in a call statement, we have to put in a number, instead of the number, we can type in Harry. Like this. And I can run this, save and run. And now, instead of writing some, putting something, drawing the ship on a position 40 or 64, we draw it in position Harry, whatever is inside the cup called Harry or the variable called Harry. And, you know, that seems like, okay, that's... Okay, we, we just made things more complicated. This ship is still not moving, right? But the idea is that, of course, we can now change things. Uh, we can change the contents of the, this variable over time. So, for example, in this update function, we said, like, like, this is where gameplay happens. This is where we can move the ship. So I'm going to go inside the update function here and I'm going to type in Harry equals Harry plus one. I like to say that this kind of, this kind of code, this kind of line is where your math teacher would get an aneurysm, right? <laughs> I like it because it's nonsense math and this is, this is this between you and me. This this is the secret. It's just it's just shenanigans to the highest degree. <laughs> Programming. It's just like, like whoever came up with this. I don't know, man. Okay. So yeah, mathematically it makes no sense, right? Um, instead of Harry, we could use like you know mathematical uh, variable names that are just x equals x plus one. Like that makes no sense, right? This is not math. This is not how math mo works. There is no solution for x here, right? Like in terms of algebra, this makes no sense. But this is not algebra. This is programming. And what we do here is not, we're not creating an equation that can be solved. What we're doing is, is we are changing something about the variable. We're taking Harry and we're assigning it a new value. We, the equation, as we said, the equation means we're assigning it a value. We're putting something inside Harry, <laughs> the cup called Harry, right? We're putting something inside. What are we putting inside? Well, we're putting whatever was in Harry before, but we're adding one to it. Okay? So on the first frame, Harry's gonna be 40. 
on a second frame, this will get executed. So Harry is going to be 40 plus 1. It's going to be 41. On the next frame, Harry is going to be 41 plus 1, 42, and so forth. So it, Harry will get uh, slowly increased. And I'm, I'm just going to save this and I'm going to run this. And you will see <gasps> the ship is moving. Amazing. We can... Wherever, like this is this is the, the real power here. Wherever you see a blue thing here, you can plug a variable in there. You can plug, we can take our Harry and just smash it in there. Just like, do it, Harry. So for example, like, I mean, we animate the position, but we also animate can animate the other position, right? The, like here, the, the, the other one. Let's just put Harry in both of them. Oh, now it moves diagonally. And it's actually really fun to just see what happens if you put Harry in different places. For example, what happens if you just put it in CLS? Ah! Okay, <laughs> I should have... <laughs> I should have do an epilepsy warning here, but yeah, like it will just cycle through all of the colors here. <laughs> It'll just go through all of the colors. Uh, for example, we can also uh, print something on a screen. Like how how about we print Harry, right? Let's just print Harry. Oh, let's just let's just also turn off. <laughs> let's just turn off the the blinking screen here. Hmm. What happens? Oh, we don't see it because we clear the screen uh, after we print Harry. So we're going to first clear the screen and then we're going to print Harry. You can see the number going up here. That is Harry. That's Harry right there being printed as a number on the screen. Uh, but also we can print Harry in a different position. We can print 10 Harry. Now Harry is moving down. <laughs> There is no end of shenanigans that you can do here. And actually it's, it's really fun and I would encourage you to just play around with, it, with this a little bit and, and see where, where you can stick Harry in it uh, to make things appear. For example, you can uh, put it in the, in the fourth position, which we said was then the color of the, of the text that you're printing. And you can see now, now it's like this crazy blinking text, right? It's great. You can have multiple variables and that's, that should be obvious, but I just want to make sure. Let's call this Mimi. Mimi is going to be five. And we here in update function, we're going to say Mimi uh, equals Mimi minus one. Th this time it goes down. It doesn't go up, it goes down. And now you can plug in Mimi in some of those those uh, those places. Let's let's put it here. I don't know what will happen. Oops! Now <laughs> now it went off screen. <coughs> let's actually make let's make Mimi start higher, 120. So now things are moving in different directions. Woo! And also you can speed things up, right? You can just add more than one to Harry. You can um, add two. Now, now the spaceship is moving faster, you know? It's, you, how about dividing? What happens if you divide? You can do that too. Whoops, okay, that's funny. That's, it kind of snapped to it, right? Wow, okay, okay. You can have like some, some fun with, with this, right? You can just like see, you can create variables with names, with funny names, you can have them funny names. Uh, you can, in the update function, you can change something about them always with this idea you know x equals x plus one or x equals x minus one you know you you take whatever was in this variable and you add something in in each frame and then here in draw function you can then call some some green functions that we did before and you can instead of the blue values that we had before you can plug in the variables and see what happens for example Hey, didn't we, didn't, can we, we can also do it like a circle, right? Like a circle? Yeah, we can do a circle, 64, 64 in the center. And then just do a Harry in, when it comes to the size of the circle. How does that look? Whoa, it gets all big. And what, what if we do Mimi in there? Mimi. Oh, 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 now the circle gets smaller. Ooh. Yeah, that's, that's real programming right here, right? Right. Good. Good, good. So this is now hopefully you see uh, how what what variables are, 
variables are these kind of placeholders, these these boxes that where you can put blue values in, in and you can do some crazy math with it and you can plug it into functions to, to make things crazy things happen on the screen. There is a one cool trick I want to show you. I remember I said how I wanted to have the CLS in the draw function. I want to clear the screen every time, every frame. What happens if we remove this? Well, I'm going to do a minus minus before that, right? Minus minus. We said like this comments out this, this line is still there. We can bring it back, but also it doesn't get executed. So it's kind of like as if we are deleted this. I'm going to save it. I'm going to run it. Whoa. <laughs> Now we're cooking, baby. <laughs> why does it look so crazy? Um, why do you think? Well, the reason why the screen looks so crazy is because we didn't clear the screen. Whatever we draw on one frame remains on the screen and we draw the new frame on top of that was already on the screen. So if you drew a circle of a certain size, that circle stays there because it's kind of like a canvas, right? Like a picture in paint, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's still there. And if you draw the new frame, you don't clear the picture, whatever gunk was there on the, on the frame, it's still there and you draw the new stuff on top of it. So you draw a next circle on top of it. And so if there's like a big circle, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, you get a whole bunch of, and it changes color as it gets smaller, you get a rainbow circle. That's how it works. And that's why also, for example, I'm going to quote, quote out the circle. That's why this, this, the ship leaves a trail because it moves sideways. So, you know, the ship is one position and it moves one pixel and it gets just drawn on top of it. And whatever, whatever position the ship was last time, it's still there. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of like a crazy little effect that I wanted to share with you. We're going to bring back the more sane version of this program, slightly more sane, but you can see you can have a lot of fun with Pico 8 if you experiment a little bit with, 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 this, um, with this, these function calls. Uh, before we move on to the doggy zone, I wanted to also, I'm gonna actually clear this up a little bit. Um, uh, I'm gonna remove all of those comments. You can keep them around, but I'm just gonna want to, want to see all of the code here at once because I want to explain a very important function that is very, very important. I wanna reiterate about what is inside a function and what is outside of the function, right? So actually, at this point, we have nothing outside of function. Our program is just three functions. And actually, this will, this will be an idea that will continue. There will be nothing outside of functions. There's no code outside of it. Previously, we had code just like we wrote the code from scratch. It was outside of functions. Now, this is no longer the case. And that's actually quite desirable uh, because the code outside of functions behaves a little bit funky sometimes. It's kind of like nice to take the code and make sure that everything is like packaged into the chapters that we talked about, right? So the functions, it's good. But also and remember that I said like the, whatever is inside a function begins with, you know, the statement here, this function in its statement and ends with end. And so there's like a book end to this function. The end ends the function and everything that's inside those two commands this part here that's inside a function. Uh, I'm mentioning this is because it's so easy. It's one of the most common mistakes that I see with newcomers is to just get confused about what is, where does the function end and where it's, is this still inside the function or is that the next function or is this some other block that we're talking about? It gets, it will get pretty mad. So how are we gonna ma like make sure that we don't get into these problems that we don't get confused? Well, indentation. So as you can see, I wrote this code a little bit weird, right? So I wrote this function here, but then when I did the CLS, I did a space before the CLS. I, I pressed space, so it's not like it's not written like this, right? But instead, everything that's inside the function is moved one space to the right. I indented the text that's inside the function to indicate that this is inside the function. One space at the beginning. One space at the beginning. This is this is the one that this is the thing I'm, I'm looking for. Uh, this is also good to keep in mind for for comments. So the comments probably should also get something like this will. This right? So I can like visually parse and see what's inside a function and what's outside of the function. So for example, if you, and then I forget the end, 
right? I can already see like, wait, okay, so this is inside, but this is outside. I can already see this, this is something missing. This will help us visually keep track of what's inside a block and outside of the block. Now, here comes the doggy zone. Right, in the doggy zone today, I'm not gonna give any very specific quests, but as you can see, we had Harry, you have Mimi. I want you to create a new variable. I'm gonna tr you try to create a new variable. I'm gonna, I want you to do something with this variable and this update function. I want you to create, a, take some green functions that we learned in the first episode, put them in here, and just start plugging these variables into those functions and see cool things happening on the screen. I want you to have this experience of creating your own green function, of making you writing a function, sticking a variable inside and making it uh, do something crazy. And just experiment a little bit, make things move on the screen, make it move faster, make it move slower. Um, just have a little bit of fun with the tools that are available here. Take this crayon and make something silly. Also, at this point, a shout out to my beautiful coffee crew that made this episode possible. That's right, this video series has been made possible through the generous support of my supporters on Coffee. Thank you so much for your support. And if you aren't a supporter yet, consider a sub or a one-time donation over at Coffee. One of the major perks is that you'll gain access to new episodes of this series earlier, so there's no need to wait. And there's also all sorts of other behind the scenes features. Check it out at coffee.com slash lazydevs. Right, and so on the next episode, we are going to learn more tools in which we can manipulate variables. We are going to learn about the if statements. See you next time on the next episode.